So you had these two double inequalities and uh, uh, you were not careful and you did the subtraction, which is fine, without changing these inequalities. So if you want to do that, what you need to do is to say, well, then I have that, uh, let's say, this guy is bigger than minus u and smaller than minus f, minus l. And then you put these two together and you add them and you get this. <laughs> okay, but many of you uh, did it directly and found zero here and zero here. So of course these two are equal. That's not, uh, that's not uh, correct because you, you are just not changing your inequalities and you cannot do that. Okay, so be careful not to make this mistake. Plus, it doesn't make any sense because it's like if you were telling me that because x is between 0 and 1 and y is between 0 and 1, then x minus y is between 0 and 0. That's what you did. Okay, so don't do that. Uh, there, are, there is a typo in the homework due on Thursday, so let me... Tell you what it is. In number 10, It's a minus, it's not a plus here, okay? Otherwise it doesn't work, of course. Uh, what else? A and there are a couple of counterexamples you are supposed to come up with, like in... Uh, where was this? Uh, number six. So you want an integral which is zero, uh, for a function which is not identically zero, okay? And well, you cannot take a equal b in that example because if, it's, if a is equal to b, then the integral will always be zero, okay? You're not uh, really proving anything. Other questions on this homework? Okay, so let's, oh, something else. Uh, I wrote a review for you for the final. So have a look at the review. We'll go over it probably one week from Thursday. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. It's going to be cumulative, right? It is. So it's going to be like. Not really mostly focused on uh, it should be more or less evenly distributed between uh, the first test, the second test, uh, and a little bit of the last uh, of integration. So let's. The review is is uh, more weighted towards the beginning of the material because this has been, you know, longer. So I wanted to to make you think again about these problems. But uh, I think it's going to be more or less evenly balanced. Okay. Okay. So last time we. Uh, stated and proved integral mean value theorem, so let me remind you what that is. So we are still in 
Okay, so this is what uh, this uh, integral mean value term tells us. And for the homework of Thursday, you'll be asked to generalize this uh, equality actually with uh, two functions instead of only one. Uh, but it's essentially the same ideas. Now, this turns out to be quite useful in a number of situations. And one thing we did last time, and that's, I think, what we call application two. Yeah. If f is continuous on B, then you can define this for all x in A B. Then capital F is differentiable. A, B, open, and F prime is F. This is actually the second form of uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's another way to, to look at it. It's, it's very useful because you define an antiderivative like this, and for many functions, you don't have explicit antiderivatives. Okay, for many functions, you don't. You, you are not able to find explicitly the antiderivative. However, you can work with this object. And that turns out to be very powerful. Okay. Uh, in differential equations, for instance, uh, people do that all the time. You don't know what the antiderivative is, but you have this formula. And you use it to do your computation. So you can do calculus by using this formula, uh, even when you have no idea what the antiderivative is going to be. So this is also something we proved last time. Now I'd like to give you an example. So what's interesting about this is that I take a function which is continuous and may very well not be differentiable okay, in many points or nowhere. And I do this operation, which is I take my function and I integrate respect to from a to x for every x. Well, I get something which is differentiable everywhere, okay, which shows that when you take the the integral, you, you tend to smooth your integral. You, you, your function gets uh, smoother, you get more property, it's a more regular function. On the other hand, when you take the derivative, you lose things many times. Okay, you have a nice looking function, you take the derivative, sometimes it's a rather messy function. Okay. So that's uh, uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, let, so let me give you an example. Let's take f of x equal to absolute value of x in minus 1, 1. This is a continuous function on minus 1, 1. But of course, it's not differentiable at 0. Okay, we know that the slopes are different from the left and the right. Therefore, it's not a differentiable function. Well, what happens when we define capital F? Well, we, we are allowed to, to define capital F for this function. So now I need the calculus notation, really, which is, let's, let's do it this way. Okay, I don't want to mix my two variables. I'm integrating from minus 1 to x, therefore I don't use x here. Okay, I'm okay, 
so I want to integrate this thing where we don't know how to compute the antiderivatives of absolute values. So we're not going to do that directly. However, we're going to, to say, well, if I know what the sign of x is, I can get rid of the absolute value. And that's what I'm going to do. So we uh, first assume that x is negative. Then f of x is this. So I'm looking now at the absolute value inside minus 1 x, a negative interval. Therefore, this is minus y. So I'm integrating from minus 1 to x minus y dy. The fundamental theorem of Karkos applies because I have a nice continuous function here and its uh, antiderivative is minus 1 half of y squared between minus 1 and x. And we end up with f of x equal to minus half x squared minus minus half, which is plus half. So that's the formula for x negative or zero. Now we do the same thing for x positive. But if x is positive, I don't know what the sign is because the sign changes. So I split my integral in two pieces. I go from minus 1 to 0. And then I go from 0 to x. Okay, Because now I know what is the sign of each piece. And this is minus y. And this is y. And so we get minus half y squared between minus 1 and 0 plus half of y squared between 0 and x. Could you repeat that? How come you didn't have to do that with the negative? Case? To break it up? Mm -hmm. oh, because if x is negative, you see all the y's between minus 1 and x are negative. But if x is positive, I'm integrating between minus 1. Maybe I, I was too quick. I, I'm integrating between minus 1 and x. But now, uh, depending where I am, where my y is, it's negative or positive. You see, when your x is on this side, everybody is negative. But when x is on this side, then you, you have two things to consider. So uh, we integrate this guy, which is minus half, uh, well, which is 0, plus half. So we get half for this. And then we get plus half of x squared for x positive. So this is defining a piecewise function, f of x equal to uh, minus half of x squared plus half for x positive, and f of x equal to uh, I'm sorry. Isn't that for x less than zero? Uh, yes, thank you. And then uh, the other one is plus half of x squared plus half for x positive. Okay, so that's what our capital F. And according to our application 2, capital F should be now differentiable everywhere. In particular, it should be differentiable at 0. So let's check that this is indeed true. So is capital F differentiable at 0? Well, we do, as always, we take xn going to 0, and xn different from 0 for every 
n and then we do f of xn minus f of 0 and we look at this so what is f of 0? well f of 0 is half see, you, you see it on, on both uh, uh, expressions f of 0 is just the integral from minus 1 to 0 Okay, and the integral from minus 1 to 0 is computed here and we found half so there is no question about this and now uh, the other, so let's, it's a good idea to take absolute values because uh, when you are going to subtract half to both expressions you get the same thing in absolute value you get different signs but if you're taking absolute values, you don't care about the signs. And therefore, you get that this is really half of xn squared. And then when you divide by f of xn, so minus f of 0, divided by xn, you get half of xn uh, squared, which then I don't need the absolute value anymore because it's a square. Well, it doesn't really matter. Over xn. And this is going to be half of xn. Because our xn goes to 0, half of xn goes to 0 as well. So this proves that capital F is differentiable. And capital F prime of 0 is 0. Okay, so now we check by hand on this example that indeed we do get a differentiable function now. Now elsewhere it's clear that it's differentiable because it's a polynomial. Okay, the only problem we may have is at 0. But elsewhere we know if, if uh, x is strictly negative, then this expression is fine. It's a polynomial and it's differentiable as many times as we want. So questions on this? Another application of uh, these ideas in the review. Okay, so now I'd like to do a little bit of uh, uh, computations that use inequalities and integrals because I, I think it's good practice for you. Uh, so let's let's go to, to four point one now and talk a little bit about uh, estimating pi. The first thing we are going to do is use the following fact. Okay, this is the algebra identity that we have been using and that is quite useful. It comes uh, back uh, in many different situations. 
So that's just uh, an minus bn equal to a minus b times uh, the sum of all the powers that we can get. So, uh, okay, we can uh, rewrite this as being 1 plus x plus, so let me keep the same notation as here. So I want, oh, so I, uh, okay. So if we go to power n here, we can rewrite this guy as being 1 minus xn plus 1 over 1 minus x. Of course, this is true provided our x is not 1. Otherwise, we are dividing by 0. So we are just uh, doing it for n plus 1 instead of n, and therefore we get n here. Something else we can do is uh, do a substitution uh, and uh, say that x is actually minus y squared. Okay? If we do that, then we have what? We have 1 minus y squared plus y4 plus minus, and uh, this term here is minus y squared to the n. And that would be equal to 1 minus. Uh, minus y squared to the n plus 1 over 1 minus minus y squared, which is 1 minus y, minus y squared to the n plus 1 over 1 plus y squared. So I'm, I just, I'm just making a substitution x equal minus y squared in this formula, and I'm getting this. Okay. So let's uh, write this well, a little bit differently. 1 minus y squared uh, plus y fourth. The last term is minus 1n y2n equal to 1 minus minus 1 to the n plus 1 y2n plus 2 over 2n plus 2, over 1 plus y squared. Okay, so at, up to this point, it's only algebra. We are only <coughs> using an identity in algebra and uh, making a substitution. That's what we get. Okay. Now, I'd like to take the integral of this thing between 0 and x. Why can I do that? Why is this an integrable function? This is a polynomial, okay? So it's integrable. What about this guy? Is this uh, integrable as well? It's a rational function, which is defined everywhere. So it's integrable as well, okay? So this is a polynomial, which means that it's continuous, which means that it's integrable. This is a rational function, which is a ratio of two polynomials, which means that it's continuous and therefore integrable. And now we take the integral on both sides. Uh, integrable every, I mean on any uh, closed bounded interval, okay? So we integrate between zero and x and we, we take x positive we want to take x positive on this. Okay, so we get this guy here.
so we integrate each piece. Okay, so we are going to get x for over 1 minus 1 third of x cubed and so the, the following one would be what? Plus y4, so it would be plus 1 fifth of x to the fifth over way to minus 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Okay, am I going too fast or? Okay, you are just, we are just integrating 1 between 0 and x. Antiderivative of 1 is x, where is y with respect to y. So you integrate y between 0 and x, you get x. Okay, so this guy gives you x, this one gives you this, and this last one gives you that. And on this side, we can split things in two. Uh, 1 over 1 plus y squared dy plus minus 1 to the n plus 1 y to n plus 2 over 1 plus y squared dy. Right? Okay, so this guy has an antiderivative. 1 over 1 plus y squared is arctangent. Again, that's where pi is coming into play. So what we get is that this part here is arctangent of y to be taken between 0 and x. Arctangent of 0 is 0, therefore you get arctangent of x. So we have something uh, that we can rewrite as x minus one third of x cubed plus one fifth of x to the fifth plus minus one and x n two n plus one over two n plus one minus arctangent of x is equal to the uh, minus one n plus one integral from zero to x y to n plus two over one plus y square dy. So you you see what I the only thing I did is I took this guy, on, which was on this side, I put it back here on the left, and then I took absolute values on both sides. Because my objective here is to show that as the number of terms, as n goes to infinity, uh, this thing here really goes to arctangent. Which is very nice, because arctangent is a rather messy function. I, don't, I have no idea how to compute arctangent at this point, except for some particular values, and this is a very, it's a polynomial. Of course, once I let n go to infinity, it's not a polynomial anymore because I have infinitely many terms, and it's a series. But still, series are nice because I can take as many terms as I want and then throw away the rest and say, oh, it's about the same thing. And sometimes I'm correct but sometimes I'm not, so I need to be careful about that. But in any case, I can compute stuff okay, by doing this. Okay, so everything is fine, provided I'm able to show that this is small, that this goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So let's see. Uh, yeah, it was the same power as y, wasn't it? So it should be n plus 2. Where is it? Hmm. No, I think I'm wrong in the book, actually. I think there's another minus. 
Oh, there is another minus, which is in front of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's that's how we get the minus two then. Okay, but up to this point, it's correct then, right? And then uh, I lost it here. This should be n plus two. Anyway, we are taking absolute values, so uh, it doesn't matter. But you are you are right to point out that it's not correct. Okay, so this we we want to show that this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. That's what our objective is. at this guy. <coughs> like this. And now I claim that this is really only this. Because absolute value of uh, minus 1 to whatever power is always 1, so I don't worry about this. And then I take the absolute value of the integral. But inside the integral, I have a positive function. Okay? Because y to a not an even power that's always positive, and 1 plus y squared is always bigger than 1. So I'm doing the ratio of something which is positive. Therefore, my integral is positive because I know that x is positive. Otherwise, I would need to be careful. Okay, so I know that all this part is positive, and that's what uh, this is. Yes, so then uh, we want to evaluate this thing. Well, this is uh, not very easy, but the remark we can we have is the following: that one plus y square is always bigger than y square than one. Okay, 1 plus y squared is always bigger than 1. So 1 over 1 plus y squared is always smaller than 1. Inverse function is decreasing on the positive rails. And y to n plus 2, which is a positive quantity, can be multiplied across like this. And then we take the integral on both sides. And we get that this is, so the reason this inequality works is because I know that x is positive. Okay, if x is negative, the, the inequality is reversed. So we need to know the sign of x before we do that. And this is actually uh, 1 over 2n plus 3, y 2n plus 3, and therefore this is 1 over 2n plus 3, x to the 2n plus 3. Uh, so now we get the following estimate, which is interesting. We get that this difference between the two is actually less than x to the 2n plus 3 over 2n plus 3. Okay, we got rid, we computed an estimate for our integral, so now we can uh, say this.
Okay, so when so we'd like to show that this thing goes to zero, but for which x does this go to zero? Does it go to zero for every x? x needs to be less than 1. Uh, if I plug a 2, for instance, there, I'll have 2 to the power of 2n plus 3 divided by 2n plus 3. And the 2 to the power of 2n plus 3 is much bigger, of course. So it's going to blow up to infinity. So this thing goes to 0 for all x between 0 and 1. Including 1. Including 1, because if x is 1, I still get 1 over 2 n plus 3, and that goes to 0. Okay? So all x's between 0 and 1 work out well. Which tells me what? So uh, when I'm saying that it's going to zero, I, um, I'm taking n going to infinity, and my x is fixed. Okay, that's that's the way I'm looking at this problem. Okay, I'm doing it for a fixed x between zero and one, and then I let n go to infinity, and this goes to zero. So, so you can calculate arc tangent for those for x between zero and one. Correct, or at least I can approximate them. Right. Okay, so what the important thing we, we got from this is the following that uh, arctangent of x is the series, <coughs> so is it minus 1 to the n, x to n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Okay, let's check that our formula uh, agrees with what's written there. For n equals 0, we get 1, we get x, we get 1, so we get x. For, x, for n equals 1, we get minus x3 over 3 plus x5 over 5, and so on. Now, the definition of an infinite series like this is precisely the limit of a finite sum like this one. Okay, so that's the notation. Okay, to write the limit of this thing, we use this notation from zero to infinity. Uh, and this is true for all x. So we have proved it for x between zero and one. But uh, if we were not so tired at the end of the semester, we could actually prove it for x between minus one and one. Okay, but your, all your inequalities are reversed. Uh, you need to think hard, which uh, at this point in time maybe is not such a great idea f for me at least. So, yeah. So what's what's remarkable here is that we get the endpoints, and so we know what's going on for our endpoints. Uh, many times, if you remember power series in calculus, you get a nice formula for the geometric series, and then you plug in a substitution, you integrate, but you never know what's going to happen at your endpoints. Here, by doing things by hand, by actually computing how different this guy is from this guy, I get an estimate. And that's nice, because then I know that uh, this works for my endpoint x equal 1. Okay, so we can, for instance, say that our tangent of 1 is this uh, numerical series. So we get 1 minus 1 third plus 1 fifth minus 1 seventh. A remarkably simple series, okay? You just uh, alternate the inverse of your odd numbers. That's all you're doing. But our tangent of 1 is pi over 4. So you get that pi over 4 is this thing. Of course, you would need to compute infinity in many terms to get the exact value, and that's not going to happen. But you can get an approximation as good as you want by taking enough terms. 
the convergence is not very very good here because we we see that when you plug x equal one you get 1 over 2n plus 3. So if I take 100 terms, my error is less than 1 over 203, which is not really great. Okay, there are things that converge much, much faster. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But what's remarkable is that a, a number as mysterious as pi can be expressed by such a simple and elegant formula. Okay, because this is really a very simple series in the end and we get uh, pi over 4. <coughs> so what if we want faster convergence? So I think it was Gregory uh, who asked Newton what to do to get more decimals for pi. And this has practical applications. I mean, if, if you're interested in uh, computing orbits and things like that, you need to have a good precision on the number pi. And what Newton replied was, why, why don't you try pi over 6 instead of uh, pi over 4? So the, the point here is that arctangent of 1 over square root of 3 is pi over 6. And the big advance here is that this x is strictly less than 1. So instead of working with x equal 1, we work with x strictly less than 1. Therefore, the approximation is going to converge geometrically instead of like 1 over n. So how do we do this? Well, we just plug in the formula again. So we would get that arctangent of 1 over square root of 3 is uh, so what is it? It's the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, uh, x to the n to the 2n plus 1, so that's 1 over square root of 3 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. That's what the formula gives us for 1 over square root of 3. So we can use this a little bit, like 1 over square root of 3 to the 2n plus 1 is 1 over square root of 3 times 1 over square root of 3 to the 2n, which is 1 over square root of 3, 1 over 3 to the n. Um, and so we get, uh, and this is pi over 6, so we get that pi over 6 is actually the sum from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n. 1 over square root of 3 and 1 over 3 to the n times 2n plus 1. So if you do a MATLAB computation, for instance, or calculator computation, you'll get that So how do I get the two bounds? Let's see. Oh, okay. Then, uh, well, the, the other thing is that uh, this is an alternating series because of a minus 1 to the n, and this term here that goes to 0 and is decreasing, so you get bounds, actually. Uh, but even if you didn't, it's not very difficult to get bounds because this is almost a geometric. So by writing this, uh, by writing at pi over 6 is squeezed between uh, minus the, si the sum up to 9 and the sum 
up to 10, we get the following bounds for pi. So in particular, we get the first five decimals. Okay, so these are the first five decimals by just computing 10 terms. Okay, so, and of course computing 100 or 1,000 terms is as easy because the formula is so simple. And you get a precision which is much, much better than that. Do yeah. you still need the... Um uh, we'd have some kind of approximation for uh, the square root of 3, though. Yes. You still need that. But square root of 3, uh, yeah, it's a, a simple, yeah, it's a simple approximation that you can find. You can find your two bounds. But that's a good point. Um, I'm also using an approximation for square root of 3. Where, um, uh, where in your book here is uh, the alternating series theorem? That will. Can you make a couple references to that, and I, I don't know if I missed it or what. No, we didn't cover it in in uh, this class. Uh, it's. Uh, That's what makes it bounded by the nine and the ten thing. Correct. Page seventy. Seventy. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then, oh, then, yeah. There are several, okay. uh, several different uh, uh, approximation that you can make. Okay. Um, yeah. In terms of. That's another one that I do. Uh, another, okay, so maybe, yeah. Uh, so there are several questions that uh, uh, people ask about numbers. Like, for instance, we, we started, one of the motivations to introduce real numbers and really to construct all of analysis is because square root of two is not rational. But then, uh, square root of 2 is still a nice number in the sense that uh, square root of 2 is a solution of square root of 2 minus x squared minus 2 is equal to 0. And because it's a solution of a, a polynomial with uh, integer coefficients, we say that uh, square root of 2 is algebraic.
Okay, so it's an algebraic number, meaning that by doing algebra, you can get uh, uh, as good as an approximation as you want of square root of two. And that's, that's always a question which, which has fascinated people, which is, is pi algebraic? Because if pi is algebraic, then we don't need series. I mean, we just need algebra. We just uh, maybe have a wonderful polynomial, uh, and then pi is a root of a polynomial, exactly like square root of 2. That turns out not to be true. Okay, So the answer to that is no. It's not an algebraic number. And that turns out to be a difficult uh, result. Even to show that pi is not rational, is not easy, and but that's done in in the book. But I think that's the easiest proof I have found because people have uh, continuously improved on on the proof, and I I found one proof that seems uh, easy enough, and that's uh, where is that? Yeah, that's the last section of yeah 4.4. Uh, if you're interested, have a look at it, but it's rather long, not very difficult. Uh, I think all the steps are pretty clear, but uh, there are many steps. And what's, what's more, it's, it's kind of mysterious. You, you know, the proof works, but uh, it's uh, rather involved and you don't have a direct approach to, to, the, to the proof. So that's uh, uh, something important, and that's why you talk about uh, transcendental numbers. So it's a, num a number which is not algebraic, is called transcendental, and that's Euler who came up with this word, and it, it signifies that it transcends algebra. You need more than algebra. You need infinite series to put your hands on these numbers. Like for pi, there is no hope to find a finite uh, formula for it. You, you know that you need an infinite series to express that number, and therefore it's more than algebra. You need analysis to do that. So f another example is uh, E. The number E is also transcendental. It's not so difficult to show that E is not rational. Uh, we have done that in 341. Okay, that's uh, not that difficult. But to show that it's not algebraic is more difficult. Do you see why? Uh, just uh, one remark. If your number is rational, then it is algebraic, of course. Because if your number is, is uh, if your number a can be written as p over q, then uh, a is a solution of q x minus p equals zero. Okay. What's the um, what's the um, definition of what is uh, algebraic? Is it um, you can solve it a specific way? And it's the solution. It's the solution of an equation uh, of a polynomial equation with integers as coefficients. Okay. So you say that a is algebraic if P of A is equal to 0, and P is a polynomial with integer coefficients. OK. OK. And is that an if and only if? Yeah. Yeah, it's the definition. Oh, OK. But the other, so rational it clearly implies algebraic, but the other way uh, is uh, the other way around is not true. You may find uh, numbers that are algebraic as square root of two, but 
which are not rational. 